Welcome to a special edition of Education Matters. This program is produced for school board candidates or those contemplating running for the school board later in the fall. Uh, today's program we will focus on the roles and responsibilities of a board member. My guest today, my name is Ray Penny, I'll be your host. My guest is Mary Ann Freeman, the Field Service Representative for New Jersey School Boards. Welcome. Hi, Ray. Thank you. Um, Mary Ann, when people run for the school board, they have expectations of what the position is. They think it's going to be one thing, and we know later on, once they're on the board, it's not quite what they thought they were getting themselves into. Could you uh, tell us what their expectations are and what the position really is? Sure. Usually when somebody's running for the school board, they're thinking about things like, you know, finances, taxes, hiring good teachers, um, the instructional program, and things of that sort. And then when they get onto the board, they're really looking at a much broader picture. And they're trying to look at all of the students in the school district and doing what's in the best interest of all of those students. So they're now starting to look at the quality of the educational program, the curriculum, the negotiations agreement, being fiscally responsible, things like that. It's a broader picture. What's the basic function of the board, uh, their job? Well, there are four um, basic tenets to being a board member, and the first is to provide, a qual uh, um, to provide guidance through policy development. The second is to provide for a program of quality instruction. The third is to provide for effective management oversight, and the board does that by hiring and evaluating the superintendent on a regular basis. And then the fourth is to provide effective two-way communications between the board and the administration and the board and the community. Um, well, the first one you mentioned was policy. And I understand that's so one of the main responsibilities of the board member. What is the policy? It's really the first role of the board. Their, their role is to develop policy that really sets the stage for everything else that happens in the school district. And it really provides the administration with their day-to-day -day operation guidelines. So the board really wants to make sure that they're familiar with their policy book and that they're constantly reviewing policies, developing policies, revising them, and adopting them. And in that way, they really do set the stage for what happens in the school on a day-to-day -day basis. Because in, practical, in a practical sense, this, the board is not authorized or responsible for running the operations of the district. They're responsible for making sure that the district is well run and the schools are well run. So they do that through the setting of policy. And policy, if I understand correctly, has the enforcement of law. Yes, it does. Uh, the, the second one you mentioned was program of quality instruction, which I think everyone would understand. Is that basically just curriculum? It is curriculum, but the board isn't actually going out and writing curriculum or, or developing that. They can be part of a curriculum committee, they can be part of that process, and most districts have a five-year curriculum plan. So the board is really going to set policy about curriculum, what they want students to know and be able to learn, and in that way they set the stage for the instructional program. So they really want to make sure that the, the program, the instructional program is being evaluated on a regular basis and that they're going through adoptions, revisions, and um, also pilots of new program for, for curriculum as they go through their boardsmanship. Um, one of the other functions that you mentioned was management oversight. Uh, is that just keeping up watching the superintendent? Well. In, in one respect, it, it kind of is, but in a much broader sense. It's not having your eyes on the superintendent on a daily basis. The board's pr um, primary role really is to provide oversight to the school district, and as I said, they do that through their policy development and management. And one of the things that they absolutely have to do is hire. They're the only body that's authorized to hire an, a, a superintendent. So they hire a superintendent that's going to be their educational leader, and then they make sure that they annually evaluate him. And, or her, and that needs to be done by April 30th by statute every year. So through that process and through the development of district goals and through annual up or regular updates, not annual updates, but regular updates on the progress towards the achievement of those district goals, they're really providing that oversight because they're seeing action plans that have been developed, <clears throat> excuse me, by the superintendent, and they're receiving actual progress reports on how we're doing going through the district goals that have usually been set for a year. So they do provide that over, that management oversight in that way. Um, so it's actually the, the, the superintendent who's actually running the, the district. More Absolutely. Of, and their job is to really make sure they're, they're evaluating them. Mm -hmm. And do they work? And receiving updates on the progress towards the goals. And they need to do that on a fairly regular basis so that they can be sure that achievement is being made towards those end goals and that they are making progress towards achieving those goals. Because part of the evaluation process for a superintendent is on, on the achievement of goals. 
that's a portion of the evaluation, and then the other portion of the evaluation is on um, executive and leadership skills. So with the superintendent, they usually act on his recommendations in, in terms of like hires and, and that, right? Well, the board will set policy, going back to policy, right. the board will set policy on hiring and retaining quality staff, and then the superintendent is the one that's authorized and that has the licensing and the credentials and the experience to be able to recommend the hires. So they will recommend the hires, but it's based on conversations that the superintendent has had with the board members to determine what kind of people they're actually looking for in terms of qualifications, educational experience, things of that sort. Um, goal setting seems to be very important because you're tying it both to the academic improvement in the district and also to the evaluation of the superintendent and, and policy. Uh, when does that start? Usually goal setting, traditionally goal setting had started in the summer or after, reorg after a traditional reorganization or organization meeting, which usually occurs in May. So when new board members are coming on, have been coming on in April and May. So we would do the goal setting, and we facilitate that process. We can facilitate that process for districts over and the by summer. By we, you mean New Jersey School Board Association Jersey School and board the field board service representative. And field service representatives. And um, so we can go out, field service representative for your district, for your board, can go out and facilitate that process for you. And that usually happens about a month or so after new board members have been seated. With the election moving, some board members, but some districts moving their election to November, um, the process probably still should take place over the summer because you want your district goals to follow a student or an calendar. academic year, the, count, the school year calendar. So um, those, that process would generally take, pay, take place the end of May, the beginning of June or July. And that gives the superintendent time. The goals are, are really developed collaboratively between the superintendent and the board, or they should be. The superintendent needs to know what he or she is going to be evaluated on come the spring. And the board needs to know what they're going to be evaluating the superintendent on as well. So that's why you want it to be a collaborative effort. Those goals are generally set, developed in June or July, as I said before, and then the superintendent will develop action plans towards those goals. And the action plans determine how he's going to get, he or she, meaning the superintendent, are, is going to get the district from where we are today to where the board has said they would like to be in a year. And so that's where they receive the annual, the updates on the achievement of the goals on a regular basis. Uh, one of the other functions that you mentioned was two-way communication. I know uh, as an active community member you hear, and you're running for the board, you probably hear from other parents, you may hear from staff members, so is this your opportunity to tell the superintendent what the parents are thinking and what the community is thinking, their, com their complaints? Well, it's, your, it's certainly an opportunity to be a liaison or a conduit from mm -hmm. the board, from the administration to the community, and from the community to the administration. But there is a chain of command in all school districts, and every board sh member should know what the chain of command is, and it's different. It's different for staff. That's usually outlined in the negotiated agreement. It's usually um, outlined in the grievance procedure, and they have a process that they need to go through as well. Parents and community members can come to board members, as they will often do, and they'll often call the newest member of the board, as we know, because we've both been board members, and um, try and get through the process that way. But really the best thing for a board member to do is to know what the chain of command is in their district. And with a parent or with a community member, it's to refer them back to the lowest level mm -hmm. of the chain. So if a parent is having a problem with a teacher in the district, with their child's teacher, they might call a board member and say, I'm having a problem with with Mrs. Smith. And the board member can listen empathetically and be concerned and let them know that they're concerned about the issue that they're having. But they need to refer them back to the school teacher if it's the teacher. If it's an aide in the classroom, then back to the aide. And everything should be tried to be worked out at the lowest possible level and then go up through the chain. So after the teacher, if the person, the parent or community member still doesn't feel that they have resolution towards that problem or toward that, toward that issue, they can then go to an assistant principal then to a principal, then to an assistant superintendent, and then to a superintendent. The board is really the court of last resort, and it's the board as an entity that's the court of last resort, not the board member. If the board members really had any part of the process in trying to help through that process and through that chain of command, if it does by any chance get to the superintendent and get to the board of ed as the last resort, they really have to recuse themselves because they've been in the, involved in the process on a personal level. So if I'm hearing you correctly, the chain of command and also with uh, uh, policy and not mm -hmm. running the district, it's an elected position that's different than, say, a town council where you expect micromanagement to a certain degree. I have a pothole, 
I make I call the town, make sure they fill it. Here, uh, a board member doesn't have that opportunity to do constituent service of that sort. Right, they really don't. What they should be doing, as I said, is listening empathetically to the person who calls them and letting them know that they really do care about a resolution to that problem, but they really can't be involved at that level. So they're going to refer them back to the chain of command. They need to know that there's a chain of command. They need to be able to explain it to somebody. They obviously need to understand it in order to explain it, and then they need to use it themselves. So after somebody calls a board member and, and talks to them about an issue that they're mm -hmm. having, the board member really should then get off of the phone after referring them back to the chain, get off of the phone and call the board president or the superintendent, depending on what the practice is in your district, and let them know and give them a heads up that they have received this, this complaint or this issue and that they may be hearing from this particular person in that regard. Um, as a newly elected board member, what's my relationship with the other board members? Uh, I may not know them. I may know some of them. I may know all of them. Mm -hmm. um, does it change? It does, it does change. You want to think of yourself as a team, and the superintendent really is a key member of that team. So the board really needs to develop that relationship with the other board members and with the superintendent, and usually the business administrator as well. The superintendent is a non-voting member of the board, is an actual member of the board though, and um, so you really want to develop that relationship. Board members, as, as new board members, need to think of themselves as entering a team and you want to work effectively, as effectively as you can, and be as productive as you can with that team. So it doesn't really matter if you don't like each other off to, you know, in your personal lives or in your professional lives. When you come to the table, if you can all make a commitment that you're going to do what's in the best interest of all of the students in your district, and know that you're going to do that, and all act in that manner mm -hmm. when you sit down at that board table, regardless of whether you individually like that person or not, you can work together as an effective team. And you really, that does take work, just like any relationship takes work. Relationship with your spouse takes work. Relationship with your children, with your friends, it all takes work. So it's something that, that they need to be mindful of and be cognizant of the fact that these are things that will develop. They'll develop it, it takes some time to develop that relationship, but it can certainly start off on a good on And I day. believe as a field service representative, that's one of your uh, job duties mm -hmm. is that you try to help districts foster that teamwork. We do, and we can. Um, the field service rep for your school district can come out and can work with your school board and your superintendent and your administrative team on developing that relationship, developing a trusting relationship and a positive one, um, making sure that your school board is working effectively and efficiently, making sure that your committee meetings are running effectively and efficiently, um, help you with developing the agenda how to set the agenda, how things get onto the agenda, and really work with the board to become a cohesive unit and a team so that they are working in the best interest of all of the students in their district. Uh, what's the role of the school board president? Does that have more responsibility or does it have more power? There's really no additional power. Um, the, the board president runs the meeting, is really the, the facilitator of the board meeting. Now the board president will have some additional communication with the superintendent and usually has more communication with the superintendent um, because they're developing the agenda for the school board meeting together and things of that sort. And um, also talking about committee issues, bringing committee issues to the board table. Um, so they And they do have legal responsibilities as well in terms of signing negotiated agreements, assigning payroll, and, and things of that sort. But when everybody is seated at the table, if everybody has one votes, and I am cognizant of the fact that there are regional boards who have different weighted um, uh, votes, but if everybody has an equal vote, the board president has one vote as well. He or she is really facilitating the meeting at the board table and ensuring that the board gets its business done by the end of the evening. Uh, I'm a newly elected board member. I have three kids in the school. I know the teachers. Does my relationship change with those teachers? Uh, do they view me differently? Well, you may not view yourself differently, but the teachers may view you differently. And one of the things that we, we often tell new board members is, you pretty much forever have tattooed on your forehead, I'm a board member. And so you may have friends that are teachers in the district and you may feel that that relationship isn't going to change. But you need to think, always think about what you're saying. And we, we really do like to say that, that your First Amendment rights are not taken away when you become a board member. But you do have to be a little bit more careful about the things that you say. They can be misconstrued. You'll forever be, instead of being Mary Ann Friedman, a community member that lives in the town, you'll be Mary Ann Friedman, and she's on the Board of Education, you know, and she said, and that could be construed as being taken right. as the statement from the board, 
and it's generally not. There is one person, um, usually two people that are responsible for being the spokespeople for the board, and that's usually the board president and the superintendent, unless the board has authorized somebody to speak on their behalf. Okay, uh, we'll come to the end. Any final hints or suggestions for a newly elected board member? Well, I, I hope that you'll come to the board with an open mind and um, be willing to listen, be willing to work with the board members that you're seated at the table with. I hope that you'll consider New Jersey School Boards to be a valuable resource for you. This, if you're elected to the board, this really is the beginning of your relationship with us. And we can offer a number of services. We have policy services that we can offer, legal services, field services, governmental relation, advocacy through your grassroots program, and um, lots of different things that we can really help to provide a school district with. So I hope that board members will become um, you know, somewhat knowledgeable about what's in their policies, review their policies, know where they are and know how to refer to them and, and look for things in them, and that you really will do what's in the best interest of all of the students in your school district. That's what your community is really counting on you for. Thank you, Marianne. Thank you. Uh, thank you for joining me. Thank you for watching. Uh, I hope you take in one of the other two uh, videos we have for school board candidates. One is on the legal responsibilities of the school board member, and the other one's hints on being an effective school board member. And if you are elected, uh, Education Matters will have other videos. One of them uh, is on evaluating the chief school administrator. So uh, good luck in your election, and thank you. For